<laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. So, thank you uh, for being here today, and thanks for participating in our class, as you know it's our last one. And so I'm pleased that Ron is going to be our, our major presenter, and then afterwards, Joe Hankins is going to talk about the resource sheets that we had, that we handed out to you, and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the very end, too. But let me open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for these times that we've had together and for ways that we have grown and learned how to get into your word in new ways. We ask your blessing on our time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, Juan, I'm going to turn it over to you. If anybody is interested or concerned, I have had both jabs, and uh, <laughs> I should not be infecting anyone uh, with anything but good ideas today. Oh, okay. I want to make a few general comments before we dive into the subject for today. The subject for today is inductive Bible study, and I'll talk with you about what that means, and then we'll do an example from uh, the, the opening of the Gospel of Mark. But, before that, I just want to start by observing that we learn and listen in many different ways. One of the hard things about wearing a mask is, I believe we actually listen with our eyes. I can hear what you're saying, but I can't hear or see the way you're responding to me. And I feel like I, it's half a communication. So when we take up a subject like approaching the Word of God with our heart and our mind, we need to be... Uh, realistic and say that there are all kinds of ways that people learn and some of us aren't going to learn the way anybody else does. Uh, some of us are going to find that we have a lot in common with some other people here and some of us won't have much in common with those people in terms of the way we learn. A uh, simple uh, thing I learned years ago when I was studying Christian education is that women tend to learn by reading some men learn by hearing, but probably not from their wives. <laughs> most men learn by doing. So, simple distinction. Today I want to talk about beauty and an appreciation of beauty. We can appreciate beauty that we hear, that we see, and for some of us, we can appreciate duty, beauty for what we do. As the church moved from um, early to middle ages, beauty became an important part of the study of Bible. How many of you have seen uh, illuminated manuscripts? Those were works of the heart. The, the monks who wrote those things and illustrated them were pouring their souls into what they uh, what they were doing. It wasn't just translation or copying for them. It was truly a matter of the, the heart and the mind. Now, with John Calvin, we took a left turn from that. In Switzerland, in most of the Reformed churches, beauty just went right out of the church. If you go back to the great Reformed churches in Zurich or Geneva, for instance, there is nothing in there but bare walls. Just whitewashed, practically. There'll be some light, and there may be some play of interplay of light and shadow around the church, but nothing like the great beauty that we find in Catholic cathedrals, or for that matter, Lutheran churches. After the Reformation, Luther didn't follow Calvin in that. Uh, Luther and the Lutheran tradition still has a marvelous appreciation for beauty in the church. Now, beauty is not just something, well, let me back up a minute. We 
talk about beauty with illuminated manuscripts. Those manuscripts were in Latin. Now, I took high school Latin, and uh, when I went to Jerusalem and, and looked at some uh, pieces at different holy sites that were operated by the Catholic Church, I could read those illuminated manuscripts. I was one of the <clears throat> educated class. In the Middle Ages, there weren't very many people other than priests and the noble classes who could read Latin. Now, talk about checking out of a sermon early. Yeah. <laughs> if you cannot understand anything that's being said, right. Right. so what do you do? Yeah. Ah, beauty in the church. You could contemplate or meditate on the pieces of artwork around the church. One of the Lutheran churches that Brynn and I visited uh, years ago in what then was East Germany and is now part of the unified country is a series of wood carvings that span the entire circumference of the sanctuary building. And they tell the story of the Bible all the way from the Genesis, the creation story, through Revelation. Stained glass windows were not only something for people to meditate on, they were probably the early, well, other than sitting at mommy and daddy's knee, they were probably the earliest form of Christian education. If you couldn't understand the sermon, and you wanted to think about something, you could follow the stories, particularly the story about Jesus all the way around the church. Beauty has made its way back into some of our Protestant traditions, well, our Reformed traditions, pardon me, in, in which I would include Baptists, uh, Presbyterians, Reformed churches, and most of the free churches. Beauty has made its way back slowly and grudgingly with people of my generation, but with people of our kids' generation, it's exploded. Uh, art is one of the primary ways that the younger generation connects with spiritual things. So it's time for us in the church to pay attention to beauty. And I have a couple things I'd like to mention. Uh, various translations of the Bible have different principles that they organize the translation around. Uh, most of the amplified versions, uh, the New International Version, which is not amplified but runs pretty much the same kind of general philosophy, try to make something clear or clearer than they find it in the standard English text. From my point of view, we get very flat translations out of that. They may make sense, but their value as literature is just about zero. Now, when I was in college, this came out. This is a Catholic Bible. This is the imprimatur here. So there was a bishop, who's archbishop actually, who stamped his approval on this. <clears throat> and to my mind, the only other Bible that comes close to the quality of language of this is the King James Bible, which I don't like to read because it was the Bible my parents uh, forced down my throat, and uh, a lot of the meanings of the words have changed. And I find that in everything just about except the Psalms, the, the Psalms are just beautiful in the King James Bible. This has really, the Jerusalem Bible is now available in the New Jerusalem Bible. It's been re-edited and redone. The quality of the language is absolutely superb. You may recognize, remember Jeff had us last week open the table of contents and, or the preface to look at it? Yeah. If you open the preface here, you'll find a very interesting name that you may recognize from some. <laughs> the, the author of The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings was one of the people who worked on this translation. 
and the quality of the language shows that somebody who really knew what he was doing, a team, because I can't imagine Tolkien um, signing on to work with a bunch of remedial English students from a <laughs> freshman college class. This was a really sharp group of people, and I commend this Bible to you, or the New Jerusalem Bible, from the point of view of the beauty of its language. Now this is a website. We're gonna, I'm just going to show you a few things on this website. It's, uh, I'll pass this around. You can look at it. This is one of the, uh, one of the uh, versions that they put up. It's called the Alabaster Bible. It's a series of not so much new translations. In fact, the, the language in it is, it's okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't rise to the level of the New Jerusalem Bible. But it mixes text and art. So on each, for each passage in here, there's a corresponding image. Uh, let's just pass that around. You can take a look at it as we get started. Um, <clears throat> let me scroll through this. The website is www.alabasterco.com. It's a Canadian company, and it's very interesting um, to me. As I look at the people who are involved in this, a lot of them are Asian Americans or Asian Canadians. This has a whole different cultural sense about it because people from different parts of the world have been involved in selecting the artwork to go into this, into this translation, into this edition of the Bible. Now let me just show you, highlight a few of the things you can see in this website, the Bring Forth Beauty. That's what they want to do when they invite people to study the Bible with these uh, additions. Uh, we can scroll down the, this web page, unless my computer is kind of dead. Oh boy, let's try this one. I'm not going to try to fix this. We've got too much to do. I will just say that they have readings. They've got seven or eight different parts of the Bible translated and, and artistically um, expanded. Uh, and you can purchase them. They're not cheap, and that's probably because they've had to reproduce uh, and do good jobs with the reproduction of the artwork in this. But it is it's good. Um, What's circulating now is the Gospel of Luke. I think all of the Gospels are out. Uh, I believe an edition of the Psalms is also out. I find this helpful in two ways. One, I think it's great for meditation. I, I personally don't find anything that helps me meditate more than this. To have a text up that I run through my mind and then to have this image that's associated with that text. Um, I also find that it's become a strategic way for some churches to connect with the younger generation within the church and with the younger generation in the community. Because this connection with art is what is happening for junior high, senior high, college students, and young adults around the world at this point. Um, so I commend this to you. It's not cheap, but um, if you're looking for something, particularly in uh, meditation, you'd like an aid to do some more of that, or possibly and you've got a grandson or granddaughter or a neighbor, that you would like to share this with, that may be the way they connect with God. So, anyway, um, just a couple of thoughts as we get started uh, today. 
Now, I'm going to disconnect. Joe, I'm actually going to turn this off because I think you'll do better connecting with it if you turn it on when you plug your computer in. Okay, yeah, thanks. Would you, unless you'd rather that I... No, go ahead. Okay. okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Audiovisual strikes again. <laughs> well... When, when I was at uh, when I was teaching, the book that was running around the faculty at uh, Fuller was a book called "The Rise of the Image and the Fall of the Word." It was an, Ox <laughs> it was an Oxford University Press publication, and it documented the change in our culture that's happened because video, anything pictorial, has become such a such a mainstay in our culture. Um, so, uh, that's also a book that's worth reading. It's not particularly theological, but it has a lot of implications for the way we connect with the world around us. Um, now, can I take this down? Does everybody have this who wants it? Ron, I just looked it up. The, um, that collection yeah. is $370, and it looks like there's about 15 or 20 yeah. titles. Yeah. And each are about 120 pages, of which I think a lot would probably be pictures, right? It's, it's about half and half. Yeah. About half, half written text and about half pictures. Yeah, so, so you're getting 60 pages of pictures and... Another 60 pages of supporting text. Right. I have fun with it, but um, that's what I do with my $60. <laughs> that was actually a birthday present this last year, so um, that's what I asked for for my birthday. Uh, we're going to talk today about an approach called inductive Bible study. It has a lot in common with what Jeff did last the last two weeks. And I just want to expand on that and get some more practical things and explore a few more things in depth. Uh, what do we mean by inductive Bible study? Well, if you had a course in high school or college in math or philosophy, you know that there's a difference between deduction and induction. Deduction is a classic one that I remember from one of my first undergraduate classes. You start with a general principle or a major premise, then you look at a second premise and try to draw a conclusion from it. So the one that was given to me in freshman a series called Western Civilization was Socrates a man, uh, pardon me, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. You start with a larger meaning, you connect it with a smaller statement, and then you work out a principle. Inductive study goes the other way. It moves from the particulars to the general. So a simple um, example from, I started college as a math major, so <laughs> forgive me for this, but if we have a series of numbers like this, what's the next number? Eight. We have a series of numbers, we could call them even, even numbers, and ask the question, what's the next even number? Or simply note that these increase by two every time we go along. Inductive Bible study is an attempt to look at the particulars and develop meaning from the particulars rather than the other way, which is to assume this is what the Bible says, 
So this must be what this passage says. Now, we're going to do a little exercise, and I hope to convince you of the difference between the two. This is from the um, first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I see it's back there. Now, I'll, I'll confess, I took Jesus seriously when he says in Mark, unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So when I study, I use colored pencils. Colored pencils. Oh. It helps me make distinctions, and it helps me see connections. So you can use whatever you want. I don't. I did not ask you to bring colored pencils today, and I don't expect you to have them. But if you have a pen or pencil, let me give you a clue, and then we're going to jump into this text. Very important term on the first page is gospel. We have it on line one in verse one. The good news or gospel of Jesus Christ. And then at the bottom of the page, Jesus came to Galilee, this is verse 14 and 15, and preaching the good news of God, that would be gospel again, we'll just use good news, and then the very last words on this page are good news. So, we don't have 2, 4, 6, and 8. We have the word, the words good news used three times. What is that? What's the good news? Gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Salvation through Jesus. Does it say that on this page? Okay, no, I haven't read it. <laughs> Jeff gave us one use in the New Testament of the term gospel last week. God loves us. And that's a true statement and a very powerful statement. Is that here on this page? No. The, the word love or father, well, there's a father sense in the words that transpire between Jesus and God. <coughs> Uh, at the baptismal scene, but it's not there. So, in inductive study, instead of assuming that we can bring in a meaning from another text, we define a term by its context. So, what is the context? If we stick with page one here, the first 15 verses of the Gospel of Mark. What does inductive reasoning lead us to conclude about the meaning of the good news? And we, maybe we should read it first. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to read it first, please do that. I'm just going to open that question and let you reflect on it for a few minutes. So read it and then note the places where the term good news occurs, and see if you can figure out what it means. Would you go over what inductive is again, please? I know you did, did it first. For, let's say we have a general meaning Let's, let's, let's be even more scandalous. We have a truth or a proposition, and we have some data. Could be facts, could be words, could be images, numbers. Deductive reasoning 
moves from the general principle, the truth, to tell us what the data means. Modern science does not operate on that principle. Modern science operates on the principle that we look, we study the data, we study the particulars, and they tell us what it means. We find meaning by studying the particulars. Does that help? Okay. Let's let's this may become more clear as we work through this this page together. We're gonna to spend our time working through this material today. Okay, any thoughts? Any? Anyone willing to take a fire? <laughs> Are you looking for the uh, answer that we came to in inductively? Yeah. Je Jesus is Messiah. Um, Close. Close. It's close to that. Joe? The kingdom of God has come here. Yes. The, the best way, I think, to answer this is to look at the last two lines. Jesus came proclaiming the good news of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the waiting's over, and the kingdom of God has come near. Well, that leads to the next step in the deductive Bible study, which is interpretation. Now, I would say, and I said it the first time I went through this, what is the kingdom of God? Well, what I want to do now, and, and then the whole, the whole scope of inductive study is to say, is to observe the text, see what it says, and look at this. We're, we're going to go through this now, read through the, the page again, and I'll give you some tools to ask, what does it say? <clears throat> That's the question of observation. And then, what does it mean? question of interpretation. 
And the final question is, could be put a number of ways. What does it mean for me? What do I do? Um, so, what does it, how do I respond? We'll look through all of these for a few items in this passage. <coughs> Clear enough where we're going? Okay. <coughs> Let me ask you now to go back in. I'm going to pass out some. These are general or typical questions used in inductive Bible study. And I'm going to ask you to use these questions as you read through this text again. Question number one, what does the passage say? How does it communicate ideas, feelings, or affirmations? This is questions of observation. What does it say and how does it say it? Is it poetry, narrative, a letter, prophecy, history, a gospel, parable, or a law? Those are all different types of literature found in the Bible. And each one will have a different way of expressing meaning and affirming or denying things. So what is this? Is this law or prophecy or what is this? To me it's the fulfillment of a prophecy. Okay, we start with the fulfillment of a prophecy. But it starts as a gospel. gospel. So gospel is the, uh, the main rubric, but we also have prophecy here. We'll come back and talk about that prophecy. Okay. Then how would you divide this material into paragraphs or units of meaning? Paul, <coughs> Paul's letters are mind boggling when you try to divide them into paragraphs. And in Greek it's even worse because he just it's he'll have fifteen verses that are nothing but one long run on sentence. How do you divide that up? Well, that's Paul. And when you deal with Paul, that's one of the things that you as you as you read this stuff, that's one of the things you've got to wrestle with. But how do things what kind of literature is it? Can any of you think of a book of the Bible that's a parable? Just a joke. Joke? There's a lot of parabolic material in Job too, that's right. The one that I was thinking of is Job. Jonah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's, how does Jonah end? Do you remember oh. that? Oh, dear. It ends with a question, doesn't it? As far as I know, it's the only book of the Bible that ends with a question. This city has how many people and 120,000 cattle? Should I not be concerned with them? That's the way the book of Jonah ends. It's a parable. Um, well, we're dealing with the gospel and we're dealing with some prophecy here. <clears throat> so how would we divide this into units of meaning or paragraphs? Are there any things that are surprising in the text? I'll give you one, just to give you a sense that there's, there are surprises here. Look at verse 12 and 13. Is there anything missing or surprising there? How did he do? 
Did he pass or fail the test? Oh, okay. Mark doesn't tell us. And in fact, it's a full three chapters later before we get anything like an answer to that question. The story just, here we have this mentioned, and the story just goes, well, here's another place where we bring a meaning to this text and say, well, of course Jesus passed. But inductively, we don't know that until Mark gives us an answer. And that happens later on. That's a feature. There's several of those in, in, in this first page, even, and a lot of them in the Gospel of Mark. And that? Yeah, doesn't 11, though, give you the answer? Verse 11? Um, and with you I am well pleased. That was before. That was before he went into the desert. That's a good starting point, but that's, what is it? Does it? Does this? Why does the devil? In, in this, what's the temptation of it? We don't know that either from the Gospel of Mark. It reminds me of "Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." That's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't want to go anywhere near that. <laughs> Please, God, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me with that. Don't tempt me with that either. I'd like to think about it a little longer, but don't tempt me. <laughs> um, chocolate Ron. is one of the ways I don't need to be tempted. Ron. So in studying the Bible, whether inductive or deductive, what is the main objective that we have? Is it for information purposes or is it for transformation purposes? Um, I would answer that with the very end of Mark. We get a story about Jesus and his interaction with people. And the real ending of the Gospel of Mark is the empty tomb. Where the women, an angel comes to the women and says, Go tell his disciples and Peter. And they said nothing, for they were afraid. We'll come back to that in a minute. But there you have it. Who's going to do what? Is this just a story with a few interesting features? I mean, did we just hear about some nice person who went around healing people? I have to say, if I had one gift that I could use, it would be healing people. When I travel in different parts of the world and see the poverty and the suffering, it just rips my heart out. Is that what this is about? Giving us information that Jesus could do that and we can't? We're at the... Mark takes us up to the point of the empty tomb when, according to Jesus' own words in the Gospel of Mark, all of reality is going to change. And the question is, are we willing to go? Will we go and see? So I would say it's for transformation. But I would like to answer questions when I'm teaching inductive Bible study. I like to answer questions inductively <laughs> and say, this is what the Gospel of Mark is talking about. And I would go further and say, it's my conclusion that each of the Gospels has some character, some characteristic like that. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to follow the Gospel? Well, um, Jeff gave us some marvelous examples last week. The section of John, we were in John thir well, we were in John three, but move ahead to John to the vine and the branches, which he looked at in the first session with us. Mm -hmm. That section from John thirteen to seventeen is one long dialogue from Jesus. Jesus begins by talking to his twelve disciples. And somewhere in the midst of that, those 12 disappear, and it looks like he's talking to everybody who reads that book. Why? Is that just for information? It's for transformation. It's for the doing. So, yes. I, I, 
it's not just doing the transformation, it's also about being. Um, Calvinist, Calvin and his disciples have been very big on the doing. The Catholics have been much better about the being. Um, but both of those traditions need to be held together. Let's come back here. Let's take these questions. What words stand out because they are repeated? How would you divide this into paragraphs? And um, are there any words, any other words? or expressions that need to be clarified. Work on your own for a few minutes with this and then we'll, we'll work together, okay? Let me ask you to do what Jeff had you do last week. Write in the margins questions or words that are repeated, just so you, you note them down.
All right, what are you saying here? And I would go so far as to say with inductive Bible study that what's important are not just the questions that I've handed out to you, but the questions that occur to you as we read this. Nothing is out of bounds with this approach. We're not trying to make anything, any text, fit a larger theological system or review or paradigm. We're simply trying to find out what this says in its own terms. Any question is permitted. We may not be able to answer it from this one. We don't know the answer, for instance, to the question of whether Jesus passed the temptation or failed until later in the gospel. Right now, we can't answer that from here, but it's a great question to ask. But what is the importance of the answer to that question? Ah. If you need to read further into Mark and see. Seriously. Let's, let's work on this. Let's work through this some more and see what we can find. What are you saying? What questions do you have? What repetitions do you see? Toby? I see um, voices, four different voices. Uh, excellent. Yeah, Where do you see too. them? Well, in the first one at verse 3 is the first voice. Okay. Uh, a voice crying out from the wilderness. Okay. Second time I see uh, the voice from John uh, at a verse 7. Mm -hmm. And then the third voice is from God in verse 11. Great. And um, in the verse 15, the fourth voice is from Jesus. It's from Jesus. Very good. Good. Excellent. Now, I would just... The first voice starts speaking before we have the word voice. Starts in line two. In, pardon me, verse two. But it is it is that same voice. So one way to organize this material is to look at the voices, the different voices that are speaking. Um, um, I, I have a question. Um, verse one is a declare declaration. In the beginning, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's not, it's a phrase, it's not a complete sentence, at least to my way of thinking. But this is telling us that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the beginning. Um, and then there's supporting material. The rest of the verses support that concept. Uh, I'll take it even further than that. Go what, ahead. what would you think of, what could this be, this first sentence that's not a sentence? A title. A title, that's right. This is the original title to the Gospel of Mark. Ah. Oh, it is. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, we have one meaning we just worked out. Thank you, Mark. Um, how would you divide this into paragraphs? Well, let's let's look at let's use the language that Dovey's given us. Um, we have voices. The first voice says, "Prepare the way of the Lord, make His path straight." Now, if we had more time. That would be the um, first yeah. I would send you into the Old Testament. That's a quotation. Actually, it's three quotations wrapped in one. Uh, it's I think it's Exodus 22:20 20, when the Israelites are about to go into the land, and they um, are told that God is going to send a messenger, an angel, ahead of them to prepare the way for them to conquer the land. 
That same language appears at the very close of the Old Testament in Malachi 3.1, roughly a thousand years later. Behold, I'm sending a messenger. Um, and in the middle is a quotation from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3, I believe. So, <clears throat> one of the ways to work with this is to see how that Old Testament prophecy functions. We won't do that this afternoon because we don't have enough time, but that is a very good observation and question. I would just, I would restate a question for meaning about that voice by saying, from the point of view of the Gospel of Mark, where does the good news of Jesus Christ begin? The beginning of the good news of Jesus, where does it begin? This is written in Isaiah. In Isaiah. Yeah. And it does include yeah. the other two prophecies, but Mark focuses on Isaiah. Isaiah. Uh, Mark ties it all together and said, that's what Isaiah said. Mm -hmm. um, now the second voice says what? What is the subject of the second voice? John the Baptist. John, yeah, John, 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 John is a speaker. Yeah. And what is he talking about? Proclaims the baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Does that strike you as strange? Wasn't there a place for people to get their sins forgiven already? The priest. Yes, the priest. And what would? You, how would you get your sins forgiven? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. You go to the temple, make an offering, present it to the priest, and the priest would pronounce your sins forgiven. Here's John. Does he have anything to do with the temple? <laughs> no, he's out in the, in the Judean wilderness. Um, one of the pieces that's beginning to happen at the, at the opening of the Gospel of Mark is God's dissatisfaction with the temple. And we'll see that later on. Simply because a religious institution exists does not mean that God is happy with it. Um, the other thing that I noticed here is that he's baptizing all people. It's not saying he's baptizing the Jews. Yeah, I got that. Um, <clears throat> it's the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that certainly could have included some people who are not Jews. Mm -hmm. Ted? Yeah, there's also the the uh, practice of, of religious baths yes. that the Jews in, have, in which would be very similar to a baptism. Would um, the uh, that was primarily for people who were not Jews to be brought into the Jewish family. So, and Qumran does a separate thing with them, but most of the time the the, uh, the washings, the, what we would almost consider baptism in that sense, has to do with bringing someone into the Jewish family. Mm -hmm. So if John is preaching to Jerusalem and Judea a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and that is its background, what is John saying? What does John's preaching mean? That any other baptism isn't... Um, that you don't no, need the priest? Yeah. No. You don't need the priest, but yeah. what is it if you're being baptized to become a member of the family? Aren't you a member of the family already? Mm -hmm. Is John saying to these people, you need to become real Jews? Mm -hmm. So what you've done before isn't valid then? Yeah, or it's not enough. Yeah, or not it's enough. enough. Very good, you're developing this now. We have this baptism for forgiveness of sin, and then the next time John speaks, he's talking about someone who comes after him. Now, do we know 
that the voice crying in the wilderness is the same as the voice that calls for forgiveness of sin? And is that the same voice that tells us about someone coming after John? And then, does Mark tell us that Jesus is the one who is coming after John? What's the relationship between these voices, and how do we know how they're related to each other? It's striking that Mark doesn't tell us. You know, if you were creating this as a freshman English paper in college, what would this look like? There'd be red pencil marks all over it. And that would not be someone trying to affirm his or her status as a child of God. Um, Mark does not tell us that John is the voice that Jesus is the one that John is talking about. He does tell us what John was dressed like. He <laughs> does, <laughs> sure does. And it sounds pro pro uh, like a prophet to me. It does. Mm -hmm. In fact, if we had time, um, he looks like Elijah. This is the way Elijah. And we could do some more exploring. Fortunately, that did not spill. It just dropped. Um, the Jews at this time believed Elijah was to come back. And that becomes an argument later on between Jesus and the, his disciples. Has Elijah come back? And Jesus says yes, but they don't see it. Well, that's all set up in this, in this first section. Now, here's the perspective that Mark has is what you would see if you were on the ground in first century Judea. There are rumors, there are all kinds of things floating around, but there's nobody to tell you this is John the Baptist was the voice in the wilderness. That's something you have to decide on your own. It's up for us to make a decision. And there are grounds in this text to make the decision, but we don't have the specific words. This is John. The same thing is happening with Jesus. We don't have the words that this is the one who is stronger than John, mightier than John. Now, Mark's perspective is a perspective of someone on the ground in the first century trying to make sense out of all of this. And what Mark is doing is giving us the death. He's not giving us the conclusions. This is a very different opening than the Gospel of John, which runs something like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We don't have anything like that. Either. Mark is giving us a picture of what this business with Jesus and the Kingdom of God is all about. And it has to do with our making decisions. If Jesus is right, if Mark is right, the kingdom of God is here. What does that mean for us? What does that do? In that sense, the first followers of Jesus were not in a different place than we are. We have to still make those kinds of decisions ourselves. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, I'll mention these and then I want to get back and, and have you look at your homework. Um, 
Verse 8, John says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I've read the Gospel of Mark, I don't know how many times, over, I think my first experience with this was in 1970, maybe 1969. I can't find the baptism of the Holy Spirit anywhere in the Gospel of Mark. Mark doesn't tell us about that. This Gospel sets up all kinds of expectations and then leaves them open. I would say the great message from, I take two messages from this opening section, two main themes that I, will, I would talk about is meaning. One, God is doing things that are hard for us to believe. We may see them and not recognize them at all. And secondly, God expects us to make decisions. And those decisions are part of the path of understanding. There's a great old um, statement from the book of um, Psalms that appears in Proverbs as well. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's important. But what's also important is making decisions. Interpreting what's around us, what's happening. And saying. Now, if we had another half an hour today, I would say, let's talk about our own church context. What's happening in our neighborhood? Whether we live in La Habra or Brea or Fullerton or Buena Park, what's happening in our, is God? Doing anything there? Can we see any pieces in the perimeter? And then what are we going to do about it? Is there a role for us to do? The very next, I don't want to give it all away, but the very next section in Mark is the call of the first disciples. So this is the stage that is set, and then that's something for you to do. So, okay, Renette? I have a question. Yes. Um, we talk about the Holy Spirit yes. in verse 8. And then in verse 12, and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Is that the Holy Spirit? Yes. What spirit is that? Okay. It's the Holy Spirit. And, and it's, even, it's even worse and more perplexing. Um, the word drive is the same here. It's the same word for... Um, that Mark uses when he talks about Jesus casting out the demons. The Spirit cast him out into the wilderness. Now the other Gospels soften that. Uh, they have their own um, thing that is going on. But if we stick with the language of this, it's, it's, it's a shocking thing. Why would the Holy Spirit send Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and then not tell us about it. Okay, there, there's... There, we could spend an entire afternoon on this. And I have to say, this is a bridge to my next uh, stuff. I want to wrap up with a few comments. Um, when I'm... When I want to study like this, I figure I have at least an hour. It's not worth my trying to do unless I have an hour in my hands. And once I get into it, I'm probably going to want to spend more time than that. So, I'll be honest, for me, this is heart and mind stuff. I want to love God with my heart, and mind, and strength. I want to know everything I can, and I want to listen to God, and I want to ask this question. How do I respond? What do I do? And I don't get 
that from spending 10 minutes a day in the Bible. Now, let me go back to what Jeff was saying. Jeff said whatever Bible you, that, that works for you, read it, and I say yes. Whatever form of meditation or memorization is helpful to you, do it. If you're just new and starting on this, um, don't expect to spend an hour a day. Set aside 15 minutes. If you're starting with meditation, when I began, had my first um, uh, coaching meditation from a priest, at the uh, Catholic priest at the monastery in Bayermo, um, he said, you're starting. Start with five minutes a day and move to ten. And as you adjust, as you learn to tune out the other voices, as you learn to focus and experience God's presence, then spend more time. But trying to spend too much time in any of these practices at the beginning is a way of letting them fall by the wayside. They're not, if God expects us to love with our whole heart, mind, and strength, what do we do in five or ten minutes of the rest of our lives with all our heart, mind, and strength? We don't. We have to grow into it. So I would, let's start with wherever we are. Wherever you are now, pick it up, find something that's meaningful, and keep at it and see how it grows. And keep in touch with other people who are doing the same thing. Uh, it's possible now. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning I'll be on the I'll be on a Zoom meeting with a group of folks from East Africa, and we'll be setting up a weekend Bible study in the Book of Malachi that will have conclude with a question of what does this book tell us to do now in East Africa. And that will be a really good question. Sooner or later, that's the question we want to get to. Um, now, one other thing. Let's just take a sampling, and then Joe has got some material for us. Um, I gave you some homework this last week. If you, if you did it, did not do it, if you forgot, I'm going to... God bless you, and uh, try again next week. No. But um, what did you, what did you, if any of you who tried to read something that you hadn't read before, or had avoided, uh, what did you read, and what did you think of it? Any volunteers? Pat? I read the chat, the book of Lamentations. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of it? Kind of horrified at parts of it. Yes. You know, mothers cooking their children in Portland and Houston. And I just kind of summarize it by Israel has sinned this we do. And God was very wrathful for that. But he is still the loving, holy God, and he eventually he promised that he would be doing it. Good. So I ended up rather encouraged where I started out going, oh, this is just gross. But you may not go back to it this next week. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll carry just up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pat. Anyone else? Yeah. Simon. I have a big issue with this tax here, especially what's happening in our society. It to Deuteronomy 20, verse 10 to 18, about the ethnic cleansing of the Hittite and so forth. How do we explain that? That is a really great question. The Old Testament is not only an earthy book, it is a very realistic book. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what we've got in that passage about eth the, the ethnic cleansing stuff most of the time in the Old Testament, with the prophets and the Deuteronomy, when you get to that, 
it functions in the Old Testament as a way of saying, if God has done this to other people, and you continue like them, what can you expect from God? In other words, it's not a way of wiping, it's not an excuse for wiping other people out, it's a warning not to behave. Not to do the things that are... Are the Bible writers in those days very much influenced by the societal and cultural norm in those days? Yes, they were. They were. There's a, a horrible story in the mm. book of Judges where Israel is, is fighting the Philistines and one of their military leaders swears a vow um, God, if you give us victory today, then on the way home, the first person I see, I will slay as a sacrifice to you. Mm. And on his way home, his daughter comes up to me. Mm. That's a horrible story. Mm. The way it functions within the canon is, within the canon of the Old Testament is, don't make those kind of vows. Mm. This is not pleasing to God. If you're horrified, how much more horrified is God? So, um, and, and I think the best, another part that is hard for me is the, um, they're called the imprecatory psalms. It's a section in the middle of the book of Psalms that are curses. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite one is, I like to find humor when I can. My favorite one is, May God make my enemies like the slime of snails that dissolve in the morning sun. Um, well, th there were some, th this, this is a section of the Psalms that talks about banging babies against the wall. Mm -hmm. um, the argument from the Old Testament scholars that, I'm, that I've studied with is, this is God's warning. If you're praying this way about somebody else, what do you think he's praying about you? And I think, look at what's happening in Israel and Gaza today. We have two sets of curses that are flying back and forth at each other. Um, and I think that's the way this functions. I'm going to quit now. Joe has got some advice. Joe, please come up. Okay. A couple of things I just wanted to cover, uh, you know, about your resources. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I helped pull together some of these resources, but we had a lot of people really supply different sources. We've got six pages of them here. And uh, there's just a lot of good material on the internet right now to, to go further uh, than what you might see. Uh, and there's also the study Bibles and, and other different things. Uh, but one, one important thing is to, the internet is full of a lot of good things, but it's got some really wacky stuff, it's got some bad stuff. Oh, uh, and so you have to be a little more, you have to be kind of careful when you go to different places. Uh, one place that I know um, when I was uh, attending seminary a few years ago, uh, we were told Wikipedia and it's an F. I mean, you don't, yeah. you don't ever quote Wikipedia. It, it is not controlled, it's not sourced, it's not... If you go to IVP, uh, University Press, or Urban's, or Zondervia, one of the great... They won't publish things that are by, you know, crazy people, because no one will buy it. But the, anybody can go in and write what they want about uh, the Bible. And a lot of people like to attack the Bible on the Internet. I, I mean, a lot of sources I see try to take one item and discredit the Bible, because this, this thing is an anomaly. And, uh, so that, that's just something you know to, to be aware of. I think a lot of you, you know, found some good sources, and there's there's some. Uh, everyone on here, I think, is, is pretty pretty trusted. I know Bible Gateway Online is tied in with IDP and a lot of other you know, good. I heard we're in need of a hero. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I couldn't get my hand in the Oh, wait, he hasn't fixed it yet. Oh, okay. He will. Oh, okay. He's I'm sure. sure. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't He's read it. He's about the age of my grandson. Can we get black on black? Yes. Have one more card. Not everybody. Okay, that's good. Yeah.
I like, I'm, I'm still on medium, but I'm, I'm heading towards large pretty soon. <laughs> um, Better yet, they have extra large. Extra large, yes, yeah, that's, that's it. You know, my arms aren't long enough and I can't seem to get it. The other thing that's right in this section uh, is, I've got mine set as a default of NID. But if you click on that, you have English, Espanol, and all. And I mean, they've got every language you can think of just about on this including Cherokee. I was looking at their detailed list. But you can see they've got NIV, they've got uh, New American Standard, they've got uh, the Message, um, the Living Bible. Uh, they've got a lot of different Bibles here. and It's good to have one that you really like, but sometimes it's nice to look at different versions if, you know, to see the different translations. So um, you can set that. And so I just wanted to let you know that you can uh, you know, do this and there's there's, I think, 70 different languages on here. Hmm. It doesn't have the Jerusalem Bible, though, that. Uh, no, I think it's true. It does not. It's, it's too good and it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> the good, really good Bible. Uh, so they, uh, they have reading plans, and uh, I won't go through a lot of those, but they have daily plans. They have a read the Bible through the year. They have a lot of different ways, uh, Advent plans, a lot of different plans that you can use. And then again, these available versions are pretty extensive. Um, Arabic, Bulgarian, here again, there's was Czech, Cherokee, and then all the English ones are there. So, um, but the one I wanted to really spend a little bit of, just a few more minutes on is the study tools. And they have a, a section called Scripture Engagement. And this is um, another approach to going through Scripture. This. And um, they have a whole series of, uh, it's a program you can go through to kind of uh, reinforce some of the things you've been learning in this class and see some, some other approaches. And I think uh, it would be helpful for a lot of people uh, to, to go through some of these if you'd like. Uh, and then it also has uh, a lot of the things that you've been studying, journaling scripture, picturing it, praying scripture, contemplating story scripture, speaking scripture, memorizing scripture. Uh, they have uh, a lot of different tools right here to help people uh, manuscript, Bible study, dramatizing. You may want to make it into a play. I always love that it, when we do that at the various uh, seasons uh, for the whole church family. Um, and then public reading tips and practices, which Public reading was the way it was done for many centuries. <laughs> Hardly anybody could read. And, and so uh, hearing the word and knowing how to read it is pretty important. And then the other one is the, the more resources. Uh, they have a, it's item two there, Bible Gateway Plus. It, it takes this, which is the basic Bible Gateway, and it adds a lot of uh, other sources. A lot of reference books, they have NLA study Bible, they have more dictionaries, they have more resources if you get to the point where you really want to do a lot more in-depth research in your studies. 
but um, going down further, they have audio Bibles even, but they have commentaries. And commentaries are nice after you've studied it yourself and you have certain questions, you might want to go in and see what someone else's opinion is. And one thing uh, I think about any kind of reference you use, especially commentaries where they're interpreting, is if they only give one side, that's probably not good because there's almost more than one view of some of the major topics of what a verse might mean or, uh, you know, what if Philippians was three different books put together or one. You know, there's different opinions about things like that. Uh, some of these are pretty old and fairly common to find, but the one I really liked on here is the IVP New Testament Commentary Series. And they don't have the whole thing, but they have Matthew and uh, Luke. Or say they left out Mark. John, maybe you didn't give your approval. <laughs> Acts, uh, but it goes through quite a bit of the New Testament. And this is, this is uh, you know, world class, this is top of the line uh, commentaries. This is what you use in seminary. This is good quality, great authors. It's reviewed a lot. It has a lot of contributors. And when you go into some of these, you'll, you will see uh, some real discussions of what uh, possible interpretations there are and what this particular author or, and or editors think about that sort of thing. Which one were you referring to? Uh, it's called IDP. Um, so it's under uh, study tools, okay. more resources, and then you go to commentaries, so study tools, more resources, and then you go down towards, you just start scrolling down, it's alphabetical, then it says commentaries, and down below that it says use commentaries. Right there on the screen, you press that, and it takes you to all of the commentaries they have, and at the very bottom is the IDP uh, Testament commentary series. And if we just take one, let, let's take, uh, how about John 15? We've been looking at that lately in church. Hmm. And if you want to take a look at Jesus, the true vine, you've got all of, you've got the actual part and then a lot of, all this commentary uh, talking about that, how it ties in. You know, how the vine is used sort of metaphorically within the Old Testament and the New Testament. And again, so it, it, it gives you some technical uh, knowledge and some theological evaluation from, from people that are, you know, pretty uh, up to speed. But I will let you know, I mean, you can go to three different commentaries and you can get, you'll get three different summarizations. So they're, they're not all perfect, but it, it does give you some more information. So again, that's, uh, it's the first one, it's not the only one, but it does have a, it, it's one of the better ones. It, it's fairly complete, especially if you want to spend an extra $40 a year to get the extra resources if you ever reach that point. Um, so that's about all I really wanted to cover as far as the online things. I, I think you've covered probably some of this already with uh, the other uh, things that you went, you went through. Um, so what you're saying is I went to seminary too early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I didn't have all that. All the resources. Yes. Well, actually, I have Logos, which has thousands of. I mean, it's they've got some online things now and are searchable and put notes on it. Just amazing. Um, so I, I actually don't use it. I, I use this from time to time, but it is a really great resource. Um, but there's a lot of them. Actually, when I was first getting more heavily, a lot more heavily into Christianity. I did the old Dr. McGee through the Bible series. He had a five-year series uh, on the radio where he went through every book of the Bible, you know, book by book. And since I used to commute to LA and have about three hours on the road every day, I started listening to those. And I eventually download, you can download free the entire five-year series on MP3. And I went through every book of the Bible and listened to his commentary. And it's a little dated. Uh, it, it's from a very, he was originally a Presbyterian, he claimed that the Presbyterian church left him, in other words, he was, cons he was a conservative Texan, <laughs> he, he, uh, but he ran a, one of the largest churches downtown Los Angeles uh, back in the, I think, 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. and he was, he was quite a guy. I got a lot out of his, his things, and a lot of free material there, too. But again, all of these sources, Bible study, uh, Blue Letter Bible, all of these are really, uh, right now media is... Uh, something that the church owns and you can have access to, and it it has some just 
wonderful resources too, uh, along with some studies. So that, it's all kind of laid out here. And uh, what do you mean by the church owns it? We have uh, a, a subscription to it. So if you'd like to look at, at this media, right now media, just ask. Uh, I think Amy takes care of it. Uh, but yeah, they'll give you. I have a. They'll send you a link, and I have a user number, and password. And I got on it and looked at, at various things. But they have some some really good contemporary uh, studies and some material on right now media and the church. We have a subscription, so it's, it, it won't cost you anything. It's just it's free to anybody who wants to get on. As far as I remember, I I got a subscription right away. And then of course the hard copy. I, I think it's. I've had a study Bible. I've got two or three study Bibles, but I think. Having a study Bible handy is, is, is pretty nice too. I mean, if you just have a quick question or something, it's right there on the page where you are. And I mean, I think, uh, especially the NIV, I know a lot of people use that. Uh, uh, Ken Jenkins used to use that at our impact group a lot of times. He'd say, hey, my NIV says this about that. What do you guys think? Um, so those things are very good. And then uh, the PCUSA, uh, of course, has, has a, a whole uh, list of things too at their store. Um, devotionals, they're they're just they're almost everywhere. Bible Gateway has, has a devotional. Uh, you get it the every verse. Uh, you can access the common lectionary readings every day uh, through their website. Um, Bible Gateway. Uh, we've got uh, Daily Hope of Rich Warren. There's there's just a lot of really good ones. Uh, Jesus Calling. I think that's pretty popular. Um, I'm a fan of Henry Mallon, and I get it daily. It, that's very spiritual formation uh, focused. Um, and you've gone through the memorizing scripture and journaling. Again, there's links here to those specific resources, uh, some of which are different than the ones we have on the other one. And um, right outside, as you come into the building, our library over there, we have uh, a series of resources. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you. We've got what commentaries, some Bible dictionaries, some other right, it's not with this there. and all, and they are a little dated, but they're still worth taking a look at. It's in the growth section, um, in the library part of the Welcome Center. I don't know, just one shelf of stuff you could look through. And if I can insert something, we were thinking. Adult Ministries was wondering if people thought they would make use of hard copies of maybe a commentary of the books of the Bibles or some other types of resources. And do you think you would, or do you think more people would be related to online, using it online, like with Bible Gateway? It would cost several hundred dollars what we would get, so we would want to make sure it, ever it would be used yeah. before we went off. Yeah. Um, when we get back to normal, the church, uh -huh. that might be a better question at that time. Okay because people aren't at church. Ted used to do commentaries and go through the books between first service and second service while he was waiting on me to finish up what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, in the kitchen. <laughs> well, or just chit-chatting on the patio. <laughs> Either way. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I really prefer reading hard copy, when you're, especially when you just study more in detail. I think it, or you have a couple of references and you can go back and forth between them. But it, it's pretty nice to have, have it in hard copy. Uh, but uh, So anyway, that's just sort of a brief overview. Are there any questions about it? Or, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of knowledgeable people around that, you know, if you have any questions, you can contact uh, I'm available, Ron. I mean, a lot of people that can answer questions that are on regularly and uh, have access to this. Okay, thank you. 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 Th